Let us bow our heads as we approach a study of God's holy word. Heavenly Father, as we study thy holy word this morning, we pray that light will shine upon our hearts. Help us to be teachable students, disciples of Christ. Help us to look to Christ for our guidance, for our direction, for our authority, for our course of action. And please be very near to each heart here today and each one listening and watching by DVD and CD. And so, Lord, we pray now for thy blessing upon our study today. Give the holy unction, we pray. And may the Holy Spirit be here in power is our prayer in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. We are living in the last days. And we were, were told in Holy Scripture that there would be many winds of doctrine blowing in the last days. And we have weathered many of these. We have weathered the great issue over the humanity of Christ back in the 1980s, perhaps even extending back into the late 1970s, but certainly in the 1980s. The humanity of Christ was something that was splitting the church. And it had been a festering issue ever since the evangelical conferences with Barnhouse and Martin in the early 1950s. And in, by the 1980s, uh, there was uh, the threat of an entire split in the denomination. But um, the liberals uh, had their way and wanted to have the denomination taken whole, as Sun Tzu says, and so there was no split like what happened in the Lutheran Church with the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod splitting off as a conservative branch from the Lutheran World Federation. The Lutheran World Federation went on eventually to sign that infamous document on the doctrine of justification with Rome. And the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, which had split off decades before, was horrified by that. We have seen one thing after another, the 2520, the uh, holy names, the feast days, the syncretism with Judaism, the syncretism with Islam, and now we are seeing the great issue over the divinity of Christ, something that has been an issue in the church since the early centuries of Christianity. In fact, in the early days of America, there were various sectors in the Protestant world uh, divided over their understanding of the uh, divinity of Christ. And Ellen White came out of um, the Methodist Church, and it might be of interest to you to hear what the uh, Methodist Episcopal Church had in their doctrines and discipline of the Methodist Episcopal Church in 1856 regarding the Godhead or the Trinity. Quote, there is but one living and true God everlasting without body or parts. Do you subscribe to that? Well, Ellen White didn't, nor did the early pioneers. The pioneers vigorously refuted this and they knew that the Bible portrayed God as having both body and parts. And so Ellen White had this very much on her mind in her early visions, and so she repeatedly asked Jesus whether uh, his, about the form and person of God. In one early vision she saw a throne, and on it sat the Father and the Son. I gazed on Jesus' countenance and admired his lovely person. The Father's person I could not behold, for a cloud of glorious light covered him. I asked Jesus if his Father had a form like himself. He said he had, but I could not behold it, for, said he, if you should once behold the glory of his person, you would cease to exist. That's from Early Writings, page 54. About 1850, she said, I have often seen the lovely Jesus, that he is a person. I asked him if his father was a person and had a form like himself. Said Jesus, I am in the express image of my father's person. 
So uh, there were very various uh, divisions in Protestantism, and the Christian connection rejected a lot of these strange creedal positions that were being held on the Trinity and allowed a lot of freedom in the interpretation of Scripture. That's why many of the early pioneers, such as James White and others, were of the Christian connection. They liked being able to study the Bible for themselves and come to their own conclusions. In fact, as the nation moved westward, the Methodists had a, a system of circuit riders where the preacher would ride horseback through all the various towns on the frontier and baptize the, their uh, youth and marry those who were engaged and bury the dead and, and preach. And so Methodism really gained a lot of ground in the early 1800s. Likewise with the Baptists. The Baptists had a little different situation. They wanted their preachers to be lay preachers. They were often farmers and uh, the layman would uh, conduct the services. Likewise with the Methodist Church, when the preacher wasn't there, the layman would conduct the services. So the Methodism and ba the Baptists became the predominant in numbers in the 1800s. So you come to uh, the Adventist Church and its uh, origins and many of the people who were the pioneers were from the Christian connection and the Christian connection faced a, a crisis about I believe it was about 1832 when they had to decide whether they were going to be Trinitarian or anti-Trinitarian. Now we have to understand that the creedal formulations on the Trinity were ensconced in Greek thought because they emerged from Roman Catholicism. Roman Catholicism is pictured as a leopard-like beast in Revelation 13. So instead of imbibing of scriptural presuppositions and scriptural orientation and scriptural having their terms informed by scripture, their thinking was informed more by Greek philosophy. Adventism is still trying to shake itself of this. Fernando Canale did a doctoral dissertation um, on a critique of, uh, a theological critique of reason, a critique of theological reason, where he examined how this Greek philosophy had penetrated and was all through theology and how we needed to divest ourselves of that and get back to having our roots in the Bible. And that, of course, is a healthy, a healthy move. Well, I want to bring to you <clears throat> some quotations from the Spirit of Prophecy uh, to demonstrate what Ellen White thought about the Godhead. These are very amazing uh, quotations. Now, in our last sermon, we dealt with Desire of Ages 530, where Ellen White wrote, In Christ is life original, unborrowed, underived. That means his life is original in himself. It didn't come from the Father. It didn't come from any other being. It was unborrowed because the creed of uh, the Council of Nicaea taught that Jesus was eternally begotten. In other words, God the Father is eternally begetting the Son. Therefore, Jesus' life would be continually derived from the Father. But Ellen White said it's underived, so she lays the axe to the Council of Nicaea. She says, in Christ is life original, there she lays the axe to the Council of Chalcedon, which was met in 451 and said that, the, that Christ was begotten by the Father at some dim distant point in the past, in eternity past. And it's interesting that if you'll turn with me to, um, to Proverbs 
chapter 8, Proverbs chapter 8, which is the great chapter on wisdom personified. And many believe, and Adventism generally believes, that this wisdom personified is also speaking of Christ. Because Christ has made unto us wisdom, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. And if we read Proverbs 8.22, describing wisdom, we read, The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way before his works of old. I was set up from everlasting, verse 23, from the beginning or ever the earth was. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills was I, was I brought forth. While as yet he had not made the earth, nor the fields, nor the highest part of the dust of the world, when he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he set a compass upon the face of the depth, when he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the foundation, fountains of the deep, when he gave to the sea his decree that the waters should not pass his commandment, when he appointed the foundations of the earth, then I was by him as one brought up with him, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him. So here you see wisdom personified, rejoicing in front of the Father, and it is believed by many, including the Adventist church, that this is also personifying Jesus. Jesus was rejoicing there before the Father, rejoicing in the inhabitable part of the earth, and my delights were with the sons of men. And so, what do the anti-Trinitarians of today do with this? Well, they have learned that Olam, or eternity, a concept of everlasting. In, in Hebrew, the Hebrew mind was very different from the Greek mind. It was very concrete. It dealt with concrete things. And this whole passage is dealing with concrete things. Before the world was made, before the ocean was made, I was, I was there. Uh, the Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way, before his works of old. I was set up from everlasting, from the beginning, or ever the earth was. So, in Hebrew thought, it looks way back to time immemorial, to ancient time. But it's a little different than the Greek concept, which is an abstract concept of everlasting time. And so, what the new anti-Trinitarians do is they see, aha, uh -huh, Jesus was set up at some point in the dim distant past. So what do you say to that? Here's the answer. If there was a time when Jesus wasn't there, then, according to this chapter, there was a time when God had no wisdom. Do you believe that? No. No. So by virtue of the very fact that wisdom was always there, this is the Hebrew way of saying it's always been there. They're used to concrete terms, not abstract thought like the Greeks. And so, the Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way means I was always there way back at the very beginning. Before his works of old, I was set up from everlasting, from the beginning, or ever the earth was. In other words, wisdom was always there, rejoicing in front of the Father. And just as Jesus was always there. So it actually proves the opposite of what the anti-Trinitarians are saying. Now, we went through, I think, last time, a little bit of how the early uh, founders, and I might say something here. <clears throat> when Job was in great distress and his counselors came, they made appeals to various things. One of them made an appeal to the fathers, that the fathers would have an answer for Job's situation. Another made an appeal to spiritualism, the spirits. Maybe they'd have an answer to Job's situation. And I see these booklets that come out with a whole line of the pioneers and a whole another line of the pioneers, and I know inside what's coming. Because, do you, are you aware, I, I don't think the average Adventist is aware that the health message really didn't 
take hold or wasn't really even really presented in a, in a coherent way until 1863, which was the middle of the Civil War, about 20 years after 1844. And all, during all that time, up to 1863, the leading people in the church, including James and Ellen White, were heavy meat eaters, even slaughtering their own hogs and eating pork. I mean, do we really want to go back to that on the health message? Do we say, oh, we found out that they all ate pork, so let's all go back and eat pork. I don't think that would interest anyone. But why do they do it then with the issue of the Godhead? There was a progression, a progression, stages of development, just as Ellen White said that Martin Luther couldn't handle all of the light. For instance, the Sabbath truth and all of that. Some people say, why didn't Martin Luther keep the Sabbath? Because God's people had to be led on step by step, and it was the same way within Adventism. Up until 1855, Ellen White and James White were keeping Sabbath, not from even to even, but from 6 o'clock p.m. to 6 o'clock p.m. Then J.N. Andrews came out and he said, look, it says here in Leviticus 23, from even unto even shall you celebrate your Sabbaths. And Ellen White still wasn't convinced until she had it shown to her in vision that J.N. Andrews was right. So you see, even Ellen White had a progression in her own personal spiritual experience. But those who have studied her statements on the Godhead have not found that the early statements conflict at all with the later statements. But there is an growing development, even in Ellen White's understanding about the Godhead and about Christ, which kind of climaxed and hit their apex with her statement in Desire of Ages, 530, in Christ is life, original, unborrowed, underived. He that hath the Son hath life. See, he has life in himself, original. He the, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The divinity of Christ is the believer's assurance of eternal life. If you do not believe, if a person does not believe in the full divinity of Christ, then he does not have the assurance of eternal life. Let's turn to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. And verse 24. I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins. For if you believe not that I am, you notice the word he is in italics, that was supplied by the translators, trying to make a smooth translation. But what Jesus was saying, if you believe not that ego eimi, that's in Greek, that I, myself, ego, with the understood copulative am, and then I am as the verb, because the subject is included in the verb, eimi, I myself am, I am, ye shall die in your sins. In other words, if you do not accept what Jesus says about himself, that he is the I am, you will die in your sins. And what does that mean, that he's the I am? Well, we can look at John eight fifty eight. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Ego eimi. And those are the first two words of the Septuagint rendering of I am who I am. Ego eimi ho hon is what it is in the Septuagint, in, which is the Greek translation that was current in Jesus' day. So when Jesus said, Ego eimi, verily, verily I say unto you before Abraham was, Ego eimi, they knew what he was saying. He was using the same words. In Greek, translation into Greek from Hebrew, that Jesus used at the burning bush. He was claiming that he was the eternal, self-existent God, and therefore, according to Leviticus 24, 16, they picked up stones to stone him. Then took they up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. You know, when I look at this, and I understand this huge drive on now, in some circles, to eliminate the Holy Spirit and to, as a person, 
and just have it as a, a spirit that proceeds from the Father and not a person. What did Jesus say? If anyone speaks against the Holy Spirit, they will not be forgiven in this age nor in the age to come. One of the most fearsome warnings in all of Scripture. And I never cease to be amazed when people start saying things about the Holy Spirit that they shouldn't be saying. But I look at this, before Abraham was, I am, and I think of what's going on with Rome. Rome is trying to create a one world religion, and part of that effort is involved with the Muslims. And what does Islam teach in the Quran? There's just one God. Far be it from God to have any sons, says the Quran. There's no sons, there's no Certainly no divine Jesus. They believe Jesus was a prophet, but he was not divine. He was not the Son of God. That is anathema to Islam, and that is exactly why Christianity has had such a hard time making any headway in the Middle East and in the various Muslim countries, particularly in the Middle East. So let's go to John chapter 5. John chapter 5. Verse 17. Well, Jesus had healed this man, made him whole, and at the, at the invalid at Bethesda. And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus, verse 16, sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. But Jesus answered them, My father worketh hitherto, and I work. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. So they understood that if Jesus said, I am the Son of God, I am equal with God. And therefore, they wanted to kill him at that point. Over and over again, they tried to, tried to kill him. Now, another passage I'd like to look at with you, and that's John chapter 9, when Jesus healed the man that was born blind. And verse 26. Then said they to him again, What did he to thee? How opened he thine eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and ye did not hear. Wherefore would ye hear it again? Will ye also be his disciples? And they reviled him and said, thou art, thou art his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spake unto Moses. As for this fellow, we know not from whence he is. Notice here. They said, we are Moses' disciples. We don't know where this man's from. What were they doing? They were harking back to the founders. But it just so happens that Moses was an inspired prophet of God, one of the greatest of all the prophets. But still, they were putting Moses above Christ. And when I see these pamphlets coming out with all these men, these founders, who had so much light yet to get, and I see their testimonies put above what Jesus said about himself. I am horrified. My friends, if we're disciples of Jesus, we go by what Jesus said. Now here they said that they were Moses' disciples. Was that true? We know that God spake unto Moses. As for this fellow, we know not from whence he is. Go to John chapter 5. Verse 45. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuseth you, even Moses, in whom ye trust. For had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if ye believe not his writings, how shall ye believe my words? So Jesus showed them right there at the end of this grilling that he had in front of the Sanhedrin, at which he started out announcing that he was equal with God because he was the son of God. My father worketh hitherto, and I work. And they wanted to kill him right there on the spot. But the meeting went on, the trial went on of Jesus in front of the Sanhedrin, and finally he rose up, 
and the accused became the accuser. And he began laying them and their lives bare. Search the scriptures. Ye have not his word abiding in you. Verse 38. For whom he hath sent, him ye believe not. Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. And ye will not come to me that ye might have life. I receive not honor from men, but I know you that ye have not the love of God in you. I am come in my Father's name, and ye receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him ye will receive. What is it about mankind? If people come in their own name, they're received and have great meetings. But if Jesus' presence is made known, they receive him not. How can ye believe which receive honor one of another? This is the answer. And seek not the honor that cometh from God only. How often I have gone up into the mountains and prayed to God that I would seek the honor that comes from God only and not be receiving honor one of another. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuseth you, even Moses, in whom you trust. So they were not Moses' disciples. They thought they were Moses' disciples, but Jesus said, you are not Moses' disciples. If you believed his writings, you'd believe me. Very interesting. That tells us that there is an essential element here of conversion that is necessary for a person to really see the truth. And I want to bring you one quote now from the pen of inspiration from Great Controversy 524. If men reject the testimony of the inspired scriptures concerning the deity of Christ, it is in vain to argue the point with them. For no argument, however conclusive, could convince them. None who hold this error can have a true conception of the character or the mission of Christ or of the great plan of God for man's redemption. Did you hear that? If, you reject the, if a person rejects the testimony of the inspired scriptures concerning the deity of Christ, now what does it mean to be a deity? When you're divine, when you're a deity, you have life in yourself. You're not dependent on any other being for life. That's why Ellen White said, in Christ is life, original, unborrowed, underived. That means full divinity. But what do the new anti-Trinitarians say? They say they believe in the full divinity of Christ, but they also believe that he was begotten or sourced by the Father. Somehow the Father had something come out of him that created Christ in the dim, distant eternity past. If you believe that, you have already are no longer believing in the full divinity of Christ because one of the fundamental attributes of deity is to have in oneself Life, original, unborrowed, underived. And that's why when Jesus brought himself back to life from the second death on Sunday morning, all heaven erupted with joy. Jesus had conquered. And it began the great inauguration in heaven. We have no idea here on this earth how thrilled heaven was when Jesus came back from the dead. And that whole inauguration went on for 50 days till, till Pentecost. The day of Pentecost had fully come. And this had all been foretold by shadows and types in the Old Testament services for hundreds and hundreds of years. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, the Holy Spirit came down in the form of flames and tongues of fire, dividing themselves and landing on the heads of the disciples. And that was the sign that the inauguration of Jesus in heaven had been completed. It was a big deal in heaven. 50-day inauguration. And we're going to look at some of that in a little bit. Let me give you a few more quotes here, just so you have know where Ellen White stood on this. In Christ, divinity and humanity were combined. Divinity was not degraded to humanity. 
Divinity held its place, but humanity, by being united to divinity, withstood the fiercest test of temptation in the wilderness. Review and Herald, February 18, 1890. As a member of the human family, he was mortal, but as a god, he was the fountain of life to the world. He could, in his divine person, ever have withstood the advances of death. The eternal word consented to be made flesh. God became man. Review and Herald, July 5, 1887. I remember encountering a Jehovah's Witness in a parking lot in a city. And we had quite a discussion. I always found it interesting having discussions with them. This individual told me that while Jesus was the mighty God, the Father was only the almighty God. Do you believe that? Let me give you another quote. The world's Redeemer was equal with God. His authority was as the authority of God. He declared he had no existence separate from the Father. The authority by which he spake, spoke and wrought miracles was expressly his own, yet he assures us that he and the Father are one. Review and Herald, January 7, 1890. Jehovah, the eternal, self-existent, uncreated one, himself the source and sustainer of all, is alone entitled to supreme reverence and worship. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 305. So the Jehovah's Witnesses, you can see their, their kingdom halls all over. They believe they are the witnesses of Jehovah, and he's, he is the one almighty God. Now listen to this from Ellen White. Jehovah is the name given to Christ. <laughs> Signs and so Christ is Almighty God, just like the Father is Almighty God. Jehovah is, is the anglicized way of pronouncing Yahweh that was around for some centuries, probably at least since the 1600s. Because when the translators came across this word, the tetragrammaton is called Yahweh, they didn't realize at first, for some time, they didn't realize that the Masoretic scribes were so fearful of pronouncing that name, which Jesus said is my memorial through all generations. Let's look at it in Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. Well, let's start with 13. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? Interesting that he wanted a name to give them. He knew they'd ask, What is the name of this God? And God said unto Moses, and Ellen White tells us that it was Jesus who was in the burning bush, Jesus said unto Moses, I am that I am. In Greek, it's ego eimi hohon. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto you. Now that's the first person singular, ehwa in Greek, in Hebrew, sorry. Ehwa in Hebrew. Ehwa asher ehwa. And God said moreover unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob hath sent me unto you. That's Jesus. So Jesus was the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the Lord God of the fathers, hath sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. And Yahweh is the third person singular of Ehwa. So, Jesus is declaring right there that he's Almighty God. And that's why Ellen White said in, Patriarchs, uh, in Signs of the Times, May 3, 1899, Jehovah is the name given to Christ. So, 
the whole Jehovah's Witness thing falls and crumbles to the ground instantly. And that's, I suppose, one reason why when I've encountered Jehovah's Witnesses in various situations, I love to take them to the burning bush where I show them what Jesus said, that He is the I Am. I am who I am, the eternal, self-existent God. Same thing that He said to the Jews in John 8, where He said, before Abraham was, I am. And they picked up stones to stone Him. John chapter 10. John chapter 10. This is the chapter following chapter 9 where he's dealt with the, with the blind man. Verse 25, Jesus answered them, I told you and ye believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But ye believe not because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Notice, I give unto them eternal life. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Then the Jews took up stones again. They were on the point of killing him over and over and over again. Now notice why they picked him up. They'll tell you in just a moment. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you from my Father. For which of those works do ye stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy. And because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. They knew exactly what Jesus was saying. Jesus was saying that he was God, that he was the eternal Almighty God, the I Am. Now, I'll give you a few more quotes from the, from the pen of inspiration. He was God while upon earth, but he divested himself of the form of God and in its stead took the form and fashion of a man. He was God, but the glories of the form of God he for a while relinquished. He bore the sins of the world and endured the penalty which rolled like a mountain upon his divine soul. Review and Herald, July 5, 1887. I and the fa my Father are one. The words of Christ, that's what we just read, were full of deep meaning as he put forth the claim that he and the Father were of one substance, possessing the same Attributes, Signs of the Times, November 27, 1893. Yet the Son of God was the acknowledged sovereign of heaven, one in power and authority with the Father, the Great Controversy 495. Christ was God essentially and in the highest sense, Review and Herald, April 5, 1906. In Christ is life, original, unborrowed, underived. He that hath the Son hath life, 1 John 5, 12. The divinity of Christ is a believer's assurance of eternal life. With solemn, Desire of Ages 530. With solemn dignity, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Silence fell upon the vast assembly. There are a lot of Jews listening to this. This was the great debate Jesus had in John 8. The name of God given to Moses to express the idea of the eternal presence had been claimed as his own by this Galilean rabbi. So just imagine if you were there, vast assembly of people, and here's a man from Galilee with a dusty robe on, and he's just claimed that he is the eternal God. He had, an, he had announced himself to be the self-existent one. That's what it means, I am. Self-existent. That mean, means he was not dependent for his existence upon the Father, either by creation 
or by somehow sourcing him way back in the dim distant past or by eternally begetting him or any of the other ways that man has tried to think up. And the strange part of all of this is that the so-called anti-Trinitarians who hate, hate the Trinity doctrine so much that they don't want to accept that Jesus is equal with the Father, they don't want to accept the full divinity of Christ that he has in himself, life, or original, unborrowed, underived, are willing to accept the concept of begotten that the Council of Chalcedon decreed in 451 that Jesus was begotten way back in the dim distant past by the Father. So they're the real Trinitarians from the aspect of the begotten element of the debate. But they don't want to accept the truth of what Ellen White said in Desire of Ages 530. In his superadded humanity consists the reason of Christ's appointment. God has committed all judgment unto the Son, for without controversy he is God manifest in the flesh. Review and Herald, November 22, 1898. The Word existed as a divine being, even as the eternal Son of God, in union and oneness with his Father. From everlasting, he was the mediator of the covenant, the one in whom all nations of the earth, both Jews and Gentiles, if they accepted him, were to be blessed. The word was with God, and the word was God. Before men or angels were created, the word was with God and was God. Words spoken in regard to this are so decisive that no one need to be left in doubt. This is the thing. From my simple mind, if Jesus claims himself to be the I Am, the eternally self-existent God, and the Jews knew what he was saying, and Jesus didn't say, now wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm not, I'm not claiming to be the Almighty God. He didn't do that. He was claiming that. And they knew that he was claiming to be the eternal self-existent God. That's why they picked up stones over and over and over again to stone him. If Jesus has said that about himself, shouldn't that settle it? Shouldn't that be enough? Why do we have to then go back to people who were still well, doing all kinds of things that we wouldn't believe in today just because they were pioneers? I remember so well Fred Allabach taking me aside one of the Ron Spear camp meetings in southern Michigan and telling me how he was going to rock the denomination with the revelation of what the pioneers believed about Jesus, that he was a created being. And I was appalled by it. He's still carrying on his work. Of course, the new United Kingdom anti-Trinitarians don't believe in using the word created. They use the word begotten or sourced. Words spoken in regard to this are so decisive that no one need be left in doubt. Christ was God essentially and in the highest sense. You, you get the idea Ellen White's running out of words to somehow explain it and put it across. He was with God the Father from all eternity. God over all blessed forevermore. That's what Scripture says about Jesus. God over all, blessed forevermore. The Lord Jesus Christ, the divine Son of God, existed from eternity, a distinct person, yet one with the Father. This was no robbery of God. There are light and glory in the truth that Christ was one with the Father before the foundation of the world was laid. That's what we read in Proverbs 8. This is the light shining in a dark place, making it resplendent with divine, original glory. Review and Herald, April 5, 1906. Christ is the pre-existent, self-existent Son of God. In speaking of his pre-existence, Christ carries the mind back through dateless ages. He assures us that there never was a time when he was not in close fellowship with the eternal God. And that answers the issue about Proverbs 8. If there never was a time when he was not in close fellowship with the eternal God, that means there never was a time when he did not exist. Signs of the Times, August 29, 1900. 
Here Christ shows them that although they might reckon his life to be less than 50 years, yet his divine life could not be reckoned by human computation. The existence of Christ before his incarnation is not measured by figures. Signs of the Times, May 3, 1899. In it, that is in God's word, we may learn what our redemption has cost him who from the beginning was equal with the Father. Councils to Parents and Teachers, page 13. Now, oh, there's just so, so, so many. But since, oh, I'm flat running out of time. I'm not going to have time to get into my, the basis of my sermon here today, but which was the uh, royal psalms and their fulfillment. But I want to, uh, since we're into this issue, I want to bring you some quotes about the personality and the deity of the Holy Spirit. Because this is, is a corollary. The people who don't want to give Christ that he is, has in himself life, original, unborrowed, underived, also generally want to say that the Holy Spirit is not a person. So listen to what Ellen White says. The comforter that Christ promised to send after he ascended to heaven is the Spirit in all the fullness of the Godhead, making manifest the power of divine grace to all who receive and believe in Christ as a personal Savior. There are three living persons of the heavenly trio. In the name of these three great powers, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Those who receive Christ by living faith are baptized, and these powers will cooperate with the obedient subjects of heaven in their efforts to live the new life in Christ. Special Testimonies, Series B, number 7, pages 62 and 63, 1905, quoted in Evangelism, page 615. The prince of the power of evil can only be held in check by the power of God in the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. Now, if you don't believe that the Holy Spirit is a person, what does that do to the ability to check the power of evil? The prince of the power of evil can only be held in check by the power of God in the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. You see, the Godhead has divisions of labor. Jesus said that this would be the paraclete, the one who would come alongside, like an advocate, like a lawyer, pleading our case. He, he would be the representative of Christ when Christ went back to heaven. The Holy Spirit can be everywhere present. It's part of his nature. Jesus is now encumbered with humanity. He has a glorified humanity, but he is encumbered with humanity now forever. What a sacrifice Jesus made in the incarnation to redeem us. We need to realize, and that was Special Testimony Series A, number 10, page 37, quoted in Evangelism 6, 17. We need to realize that the Holy Spirit, who is as much a person as God is a person, is walking through these grounds. Manuscript 66, 1899, from a recorded talk given to the students at Avondale, cited in Evangelism 616. What was that again? That we need to realize that the Holy Spirit, who is as much a person as God is a person, is walking through these grounds. Oh, Ellen White says when, when you're in the classroom and the teacher senses and the students sense the presence of the Holy Spirit in the, in the classroom, the teacher needs to say, let us put away our books. We have a divine instructor here today and let us learn from him. Another quote, the Holy Spirit is a person. Now, are you going to believe the inspired prophet of God? Or are you going to believe uninspired men who didn't believe that the Holy Spirit is a person? That's the, that's the question. Are you going to believe inspiration? Jesus believed that the Holy Spirit was a person. He said, if you speak against the Son, you can have forgiveness. But if you speak against the Holy Ghost, you'll have no forgiveness, either in this age or in the age to come. That's a fearsome warning. 
The Holy Spirit is a person, for he beareth witness with our spirits that we are the children of God. When this witness is born, it carries with it its own evidence. At such times we believe and are sure that we are the children of God. The Holy Spirit has a personality. He can be grieved. I'm just adding that to point that out. Else he could not bear witness to our spirits and with our spirits that we are the children of God. So what was that again? What is this evidence of the personality? The Holy Spirit has a personality. Else he could not bear witness to our spirits and with our spirits that we are the children of God. He must also be a divine person. Else he could not search out the secrets which lie hidden in the mind of God. And with that, let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Oh, one of my favorite passages. We simply have to look at this. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, starting with verse 5. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. And you often stop there. But look at the next verse. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. The Holy Spirit will reveal to your heart things that eye hath not seen, ear hath not heard, neither has entered into the heart of man. What an education from the Holy Spirit, the greatest educator. Oliver Cromwell said, I want to establish schools all over England where the students learn how to listen to the Holy Spirit. God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. That's personality. That's personhood. The Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received, not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of Christ. Do you understand how this will expand your mind? How this will expand your heart? Expand your will and your willpower and transform your life completely. The Holy Spirit. Oh, we need the early rain of the Holy Spirit to prepare the way for the latter rain. The early rain of daily having our heart expanded with the knowledge of the living God because the Spirit of God who searches the deep things of God takes those things and reveals them to us. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth. I have to tell you something. When I was about 16, I began noticing that there was a voice that was speaking to me deep in my heart. Not audibly, but it was a voice nonetheless speaking deep in my heart. And I th began thinking, what is this? What is this deep, wonderful thing that I'm experiencing? Every little bit I would experience this. And then it dawned on me, that is the voice of the Holy Spirit. And you better pay attention. You better listen. You better obey. You better follow. You better be awake to that voice and encourage that voice. And that's one reason why I eventually spent hours every day riding my cycle through the mountains of North Georgia and Tennessee, communing with God. It is the most glorious thing that a person can experience. To have the advocate, Christ's personal representative, come to you and start speaking to you in your heart and you listening and have your heart expanded and, and your will expanded and your brain expanded and your mind expanded and your life expanded with the deep things of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Freely given to you the riches of the deep things of God. Which things also we speak not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth. 
comparing spiritual things with spiritual. And do you think some of those things? Jesus said, he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. Remember what Jesus said about what the Holy Spirit would do? Let's look at John chapter 14. John chapter 14. Verse 16, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter. Do you need comfort in your life? I do. I want the deepest comfort that there can be. I want the comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not. I'll tell you, that's why there's a controversy over whether Jesus is fully divine in truth. That's why there's a controversy over whether Christ has in himself life, original, unborrowed, underived. It's whether a person has the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come unto you. Verse 23. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him, and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things." So notice the personality there. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. And I don't care whether you've gone to college or even academy or whether you've gone past grade three like Ellen White. Ellen White was one of the greatest writers that the world has ever seen with a third grade education. When M. L. Andreasen went out to Elmshaven to talk to her, to see whether she had actually written those words, to see if those words were in her own penmanship. In Christ is life, original, unborrowed, underived, and he saw that they were. He said, I went away astonished and perplexed. How was it possible that a person with three grades of education could write such elegance, in such depth, such power, was the idea. He was the dean of our Adventist theologians. Would to God we had some like him again. He shall teach you all things. Do you know that Ellen White says that the Holy Spirit can teach you more in one moment than all the great men of history? In one moment. I tell you, we need this power of the Holy Spirit in the times that we're entering into. It's no coincidence that Satan is trying to eliminate the Holy Spirit as being a person just before God's people need the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and need to know him personally and to hear his voice personally and to be taught of him personally. The Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Back to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teaching, teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Verse 16. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts for the testimony of Jesus himself over and over and over again that he is the I am. Not only at the burning bush, but all through the Gospel of John. And in so many passages is this upheld in Scripture. And that he has sent to us his personal representative, the person of the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, who will teach us all things and teach us more things in one moment than all the great men of history a greater education than the highest university of this world could ever bestow, infinitely higher. The teaching of eternity, the teaching of the deep things of God, the teaching of the deep things of the divinity of Christ, something that no 
created mind can wrap itself around. Teach us, O Lord. Guide us. Prepare our hearts for the outpouring of the latter rain is our prayer in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.